to Nathan to tell us all about uh, sulfate uh, story, I suppose. That's a nice way to say it. <laughs> merci, Neha. Uh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. C'est ma première fois à uh, parler dans une université française. C'est un grand honneur. Uh, encore merci. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to talk about the coevolution of continental weathering and the evolution of microbial metabolism. And I'm going to use sulfate as a, as a case study. And I'm going to begin today's story um, by reviewing, oh, if I can advance my slide, oh. um, I'd have to stop sharing and rest okay. restart this. So I'm going to start my story by reviewing the uh, Archean sulfur cycle. Um, we still don't see the next slide yet. There okay. we go. There we go. So my, my research is currently funded by NASA uh, to study deep time mineral uh, evolution. And uh, the, this period of time on, in Earth's history, the Archeneon, which spans 4 billion to 2.5 billion years ago, was a very different world than the modern planet Earth. During this time, uh, Earth's atmosphere was devoid of molecular oxygen and we had a very different sulfur cycle. This is a picture drawn by my son, uh, Forrest, which shows the main source of sulfur dioxide to Earth's atmosphere, which was volcanism. Now, during this time, Earth had a ozone-free stratosphere. And because there was no ozone layer, UV light could penetrate through the atmosphere and interact with atmospheric gases. So sulfur dioxide interacts very strongly with ultraviolet light. And UV photolysis of SO2 forms elemental sulfur and sulfate aerosols. We know this uh, UV photolysis occurred because this photochemical reaction generates mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes that are recorded in Archean pyrite samples. Now this, this sulfate that was formed deposited into the Earth's oceans, some of it was reduced to sulfide. But we have to remember that during this time in Earth's history, the concentrations of sulfate were a thousand times lower than today's oceans. And some geobiologists think that at these very low concentrations, sulfate might have been a limiting nutrient for early life. Most of the sulfate was assimilated by microorganisms to generate this organic sulfur pool. Now this elemental sulfur that was deposited in the ocean, some of it was oxidized to sulfate, but most of it was reduced to sulfide and precipitated as pyrite. And these pyrite uh, precipitates are preserved in fine grained sedimentary rocks, which over time uplifted onto land as the continents continue to grow during the Archean Eon. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, a very interesting observation was made by Eva Stunkin uh, a few years ago in a paper she published in Nature Geoscience, which showed that uh, marine sedimentary sulfides change through geologic time. This is a very nice study. Eva actually spent the summer uh, in my lab when she was a graduate student at the University of Washington. And what she did in this paper was she compiled over 1,200 different samples from 70 different rock formations that spanned from 3.5 billion years old all the way to the Mesoproterozoic, 1.5 billion years old. And what she found was the concentration of marine sedimentary sulfide increased through time. 
And she tested various models to explain this observation. And the only model that made sense was one that had uh, changes in continental weather influx during the Neo-Archean. So in this paper, she hypothesized this was due to the evolution of life on land. And her hypothesis echoed uh, the sentiments of Kurt Kahnhauser, who uh, also uh, postulated that there was aerobic bacterial pirate oxidation and acid rock uh, drainage that was formed during the Great Oxidation Event. And so the Great Oxidation Event started around 2.5 billion years ago. This last bullet point, in fact, is the title of uh, uh, a nature paper that Kurt Kahnhauser uh, published a few years ago. Now, both Ava and, and Kurt, I did my postdoc with Kurt Kahnhauser. They're, they're very good friends of mine, okay? But I'm going to challenge uh, the model that they are proposing. And I'm going to argue that you don't need life and you don't need oxygen to generate uh, this observation. Now, first, why do people think that you need oxygen and microbes to weather pyrite? Okay, so this is another drawing of my son. So I'm just recapping what this, what this previous observation is trying to say. There was pyrite on land, oxygen, either chemically or via microbial catalysis, oxidized the pyrite to form sulfate. The sulfate was delivered by rivers and streams to the oceans. And the concentration of sulfate in the oceans is recorded in marine sedimentary sulfites. So this is the, this is the current model of what we think happened on the early Earth. Okay? So I'm going to argue you don't need oxygen and you don't need microorganisms for this process to occur. Now, why do people think you need microbes and oxygen? Well, it's because of reactions like this you find in every geochemical, uh, geochemistry textbook, okay? So shown here on the, on the left-hand side of this reaction, we have pyrite reacting with oxygen to form ferrous iron and sulfate, okay? So we do know that this reaction definitely occurs on the modern earth and uh, oxygen plays a, a very important role in generating the sulfate, but also liberating this ferrous iron, okay? Now, oxygen plays another role, which is it oxidizes this ferrous iron to form ferric iron, okay? Now, uh, this reaction occurs, for example, uh, all over the world today at, uh, acid mine drainage sites. Okay. Now, at low pH in acidic waters, this reaction is, is thermodynamically favorable, but kinetically very slow. Okay. And there's a group of aerobic chemolithotrophs that will catalyze this reaction, for example, acetylthiobacillus ferrioxidans, to form uh, ferric iron from ferrous iron. Now, once you have this ferric iron, this ferric iron can chemically attack the pyrite surface, okay, to generate lots more sulfate and a lot of acid, okay? So we know this occurs on the modern earth. But what I realized recently was that on the early earth, the iron cycle was fundamentally driven by photochemistry, okay? So the surface waters on the Archean Earth had a lot of, was, was completely anoxic, and they, these waters contained high concentrations of ferrous iron. And one very interesting thing about ferrous iron is that if you have a test tube of ferrous iron and you hold it up to a UV lamp, this ferrous iron will photooxidize very quickly. You can't stop it from happening. Okay, so you can generate ferric iron without microorganisms and without oxygen, okay? So the question is, can photochemically derived ferric iron react with pyrite to form sulfate in the absence of oxygen? 
And I hypothesize, yes, you can. Okay. So we built an experimental setup in my lab to test this hypothesis. Okay. So here I have a uh, mercury lamp that generates UV light. And surrounding this lamp are six UV transparent quartz reaction vessels. And in our experiment, what we do is we crush pyrite and we suspend these pyrite particles in deoxygenated water. And we add some ferrous chloride to the solution. So around 200 micromolar ferrous chloride. We then turn on the lamp and let uh, the UV light irradiate our reactors. And periodically we'll sample the reactors and measure sulfate concentrations using ion chromatography. We also measure the composition of the gases in the headspace and uh, the release of trace metals using ICP OEMs. Okay, so this is what we found. This is a hot new result, all done during pandemic times. Okay, our goal is to write this up this summer. Okay, so first I'm gonna show you the control experiment. So in our control experiments, we wrap the quartz uh, reaction vessels with aluminum foil to prevent any photochemistry. Okay. And in the dark, we don't see any sulfate formation and we don't see any changes in the solution pH. Okay. Now, when we turn on the light, some fun stuff starts happening. We get a lot of sulfate forming in the water and we get acidification of the waters in these re reaction vessels. Okay, so this is a very exciting result for us. This tells us that we can generate sulfate without oxygen using photochemistry. So what's happening here is the UV light is photo oxidizing the ferrous iron and the photochemically derived ferric iron is attacking the pyrite surface to generate sulfate. Ferric iron turns out to be a very, very potent oxidant. So we then ask the question whether or not this has any relevance on the Archean Earth. And to study this further, we repeated these experiments uh, with an Archean pyrite sample. So shown here is the sample we used in our experiment. It's a piece of pyritic shale that was uh, mined from the Golden Mile Super Pit in Western Australia. The sample was given to us by Jeffrey Stedman at the University of Tasmania. And the sample dates to 2.65 billion years old. He's done a lot of work on the sample and uh, he's published many papers that have shown that the, set, the pyrite in the sample was formed either during sedimentation or early sediment diagenesis. What you can see are these pyrite nodules on the top portion of the sample and this very fine grain disseminated pyrite in a black shale matrix in the middle of the sample and some quartz lenses at the bottom. So we took the top two thirds of the sample and crushed it for our photochemistry experiment. And we found the same thing. In the dark, there was no reaction, no change in sulfate concentrations, no change in solution pH. We turned on the light and we saw sulfate forming in aqueous solution as concurrent to acidification of the waters. We also did another experiment where we removed the ferrous iron, we removed the ferrous chloride from the solution and just use UV light, okay? And that's shown here in the squares, okay? And without the ferrous iron, just by shining UV light, you don't get a reaction, okay? You, there's no sulfate formation, and there's no acidification of the waters, okay? So you need both light and uh, low concentrations of ferrous iron in contact with pyrite to drive this photochemical process. Then we also took samples and measured uh, the release of metals from the pyrite structure, okay? So you know that there's no such thing as pure pyrite, all pyrite contains uh, trace elements that are contained within its crystal structure. So the first experiment we did was just a pyrite uh, 
that we brought from Sigma Altrich, okay? And uh, the Arkeem pyrite had a lot, uh, also had lots of metal. And I'm just showing you here some copper data, okay? So copper, there's a lot of controversy about how much copper there was uh, in the Arkeen oceans, okay? Because copper is an essential element that led to the evolution of aerobic respiration, the terminal uh, step of aerobic, re resp aerobic respiration is catalyzed by a copper containing enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. And there's a lot of debate about how much copper there was for the, and when this evolution event occurred, okay? So shown here is that when we uh, photochemically react the pyrite in the presence of ferrous iron, the pyrite dissolves. And when the pyrite dissolves, it not only releases sulfate, but it also releases the trace elements in the pyrite structure including elements such as copper. In the dark, nothing happens. There is no metal release, shown in the black symbols. When we turn on the light, we get copper release both from both our uh, sigma pyrite sample as well as our arcane pyrite sample. So these are all new results that we're hoping to write up this summer. Um, so this is our, there's another drawing by my son. He's very proud of this one. He doesn't go, you know, his school shut down. So we had to spend a lot of time at home and he helped, he had to help me with my research. So his contributions, I promise I would acknowledge his efforts in the talk, okay. <laughs> so this is what we're thinking is going on. There was ferrous iron in surface waters on the Archean earth. During the daytime, when UV light was shining on land, this ferrous iron was photooxized to ferric iron. This ferric iron could then uh, percolate into uh, the Archean regolith to, to promote uh, chemical weathering reactions. In the presence of pyritic uh, materials, this ferric iron would oxidize the sulfide to produce sulfate. And the sulfate can be transported either through groundwater flow or surface water flow, flow and discharge into the oceans. So we don't need life on land. We don't need oxygen. We only need landmass. So there's a lot of debate about how much continent of landmass there was uh, during Archean time. So we're trying to uh, do some modeling right now to constrain how much landmass was exposed to sunlight. Maybe this rise in marine sulfate was simply due to continental growth. It had nothing to do with evolution of life on land, had nothing to do with uh, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. We're also doing experiments now with Huming Bao to uh, measure the isotopic composition of the oxygen associated uh, with the sulfide, whether or not this has a unique isotopic signature that could be distinguished from the oxygen reaction and an anoxic photochemical reaction. So that's the ongoing work in my lab. So now I'm gonna pivot and talk about some microbiology. Particularly, I wanna talk about uh, the role of sulfate in biological systems. So of course the release of sulfate into the biosphere in the early years had profound uh, effects on the evolution of microbial life. In the global sulfur cycle, microorganisms play a very important role in catalyzing the reduction of sulfate to sulfide. And there are two well-known pathways that microbes do this, the simulatory sulfate reduction and assimilatory sulfate reduction. So in dissimilatory sulfate reduction, microbes are using sulfate as a terminal electron acceptor for respiration, okay? They do this by importing sulfate into the cell. This sulfate is activated to adenosine phosphosulfate, and this APS is reduced to sulfite. The sulfite is reduced by this, the dissimilatory sulfite reductase uh, to sulfide, okay? And the sulfide is released from the cells, and this is the process that occurs uh, in marine sediments all over, all over the world. Now, whereas this is a very important process on the modern earth, I will emphasize that in bacteria, only a few microbial groups carry the genes for this pathway. For example, the delta pointer bacteria, okay? Much more widespread in biology is the assimilatory sulfate reduction pathway. And this pathway is found in both bacteria and archaea, as well as eukarya, okay? 
Here, sulfate is imported into the cell, activated to APS. This APS is converted to phosphoadenosine phosphosulfate, PAPS, which is reduced to sulfite. Sulfite is a key intermediate. The sulfite is reduced to sulfide, and the sulfide is incorporated into amino acids by the cysteine synthase. So a very uh, important discovery that was made several years ago is that microbes that perform assimilatory sulfate reduction actually secrete low levels of sulfide to its external environment. And this has a very important biological function. So a group at New York uh, University in their medical school, what they found uh, reported here in a 2011 science paper is that phylogenetically diverse bacteria releases low levels of uh, hydrogen sulfide to their external environment. And this plays a, a, a crucial role in the defense against antibiotics, okay? Now, I was very interested in this paper because at that time I was doing experiments uh, with Schoenonella oenodensis, which is a very famous metal reducing uh, uh, bacterium. So we were studying how uh, Schoenonella was uh, interacting with mercury and other metals, and we're particularly interested in metal uptake into the cell. Now, as you are probably well aware, metal uptake into the cell is strongly dependent on metal speciation, the chemical form of the metal, and Hydrogen sulfide can alter the chemical speciation of metals. So we wanted to uh, measure how much hydrogen sulfide was being produced by Schumanella and whether or not it was producing other reactive sulfur species, okay? So this was actually a project done by my PhD student, Jennifer Goff. And she developed a method to measure very carefully how much uh, reactive sulfur uh, compounds metabolites were being produced uh, by Schuonella. Here's her experimental procedure. She grew Schuonella anaerobically using lactate as the electron donor and fumarate as the electron acceptor. And she provided sulfate as the sole sulfur source. Okay. As the cultures grew, she took samples and collected the filtrates. She derivatized the, the filtrates using this fluorophore called monobromobimane. This compound reacts specifically to reduce sulfur uh, species. And once it's bound to the sulfur, it produces fluorescence, okay? So it binds to thiols, binds to sulfide, sulfate, thiol sulfate. It does not bind to um, oxidized sulfur in the form of sulfate, okay? After she derivatized the samples, she ran the, uh, the filtrates through an HPLC with a C18 column connected to a fluorescence detector. Okay. So this is one of the first chromatograms she showed me. She did this detect some sulfide, a bit of thiol sulfate, some cysteine and glutathione, but an enormous amount of sulfite huge amounts of sulfate. And this was uh, a surprise to us. And upon more detailed experimentation, she found that sulfite was the dominant reactive sulfur species that was secreted by Schuonella, okay? In fact, the, the extracellular sulfide concentration exceeded sulfide uh, by 400 fold, okay? This is a plot of sulfide concentrations during growth and she observed over 80 micromolar of sulfite in the culture medium, okay? And this is a uh, pretty high amount, okay? Now she also detected sulfite during aerobic growth, but a lot less, despite the fact that there was much more uh, cell growth, okay? And we think this is due to the fact that sulfite's so reactive that in aerobic cultures, the sulfite was reacting with oxygen. So we did some experiments and indeed, this is the case, okay? So when you put sulfite in the in an aerobic media, what you find is the sulfite in the absence of cells uh, is rapidly oxidized to sulfate. So you, we observed the loss of sulfite 
concurrent to the formation of sulfate over time. Okay, so this led to us asking the question whether or not this sulfite might play a biological role. Is it by accident that Schuonella is producing all this sulfite or is it doing it for some sort of purpose? Uh, so because of sulfite is reacting with oxygen, we, we hypothesized that sulfite might be, be formed um, and had a, a role in oxidative stress. Okay. So what is oxidative stress? Okay. So this is a slide I, I made for uh, mineralogists and geologists. Okay. So what is oxidative stress? Well, let's first review uh, aerobic respiration. So in our, and in, this is a picture of the uh, electron transport chain. And in, in aerobic respiration, uh, we shuttle electrons down the electron transport chain. This ejects protons out of the cell. This, uh, this creates an, uh, an electrochemical gradient known as the proton motor force. There's a membrane bound enzyme called ATPase that transforms the proton motor force into ATP. What drives this reaction is this terminal uh, reduction step where a copper containing enzyme, the cytochrome C oxidase, oxidizes um, uh, this terminal reductase, reduces oxygen to water. It's a four electron uh, reaction, no problems here. Okay, so this is how the electron transfer chain is supposed to work. The problem arises when oxygen accidentally interacts with other components of the electron transport chain. And when it accidentally interacts with other components of the electron tra transport chain, oxygen is partially reduced and it forms things like superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. And these, these reactive oxygen species are highly toxic to cells, okay? This is a problem that microbes that breathe oxygen have to deal with. It's something that humans in our, our bodies, we have to deal with. And, and biology has evolved all these mechanisms to deal with oxidative stress, okay? Now, there's some microbes that have figured out that hydrogen peroxide is very toxic and they use it as a weapon, okay, to kill its competitors. An example of this is the streptococcus on your teeth. Okay, so, so streptococcus, will release hydrogen peroxide to kill its competitors so they can't form biofilms on your teeth, okay? So it, it's the one that can, streptococcus can dominate that uh, microbial niche. And this is, a, this is biological warfare that occurs from oral cavities to lake sediments, okay? Now, an interesting thing that uh, with hydrogen peroxide is that sulfite can react with hydrogen peroxide to neutralize it and form sulfate and water, okay? So, sulfa, so sulfite reacts with hydrogen peroxide to form sulfate and water. So could it be that Schuonella is making sulfite to combat oxidative stress? And we did some experiments to test this, okay? So shown on the top panel here are three experiments. The first experiment, it's a control where we just suspended some wash cells in fresh media. Okay. In the second experiment, we spiked these cultures with hydrogen peroxide. And we saw that over 90% of the cells died. Okay. In the third experiment, we added sulfite first, and then we added hydrogen peroxide and we saw much, much greater uh, survival rates with sulfite treatment, okay? We also did experiments where we monitored what would happen to the sulfite uh, upon reaction with hydrogen peroxide. So in our control experiment, we just had sulfite in the anaerobic medium, nothing happened to the sulfite. We added hydrogen peroxide, sulfite quickly reacted with the hydrogen peroxide and was degraded to sulfate, shown here in sulfite loss. Okay. So I think these data indicate that sulfite can protect against oxidative stress. Okay. Now, it was shown that microbes release hydrogen sulfide to protect against antibiotics. So we've wondered whether or not sulfite also protects 
true vanilla from antibiotics because we know that microbes secrete antibiotics also to kill its competitors. And uh, th it would be a very interesting finding if sulfite had some sort of role in, uh, in antibiotic defense. And indeed it does, okay? So shown here are some growth curves when we conduct experiments with four beta-lactam uh, antibiotics, cephalzolin, meropenem, doripenem, and ertapenem. Shown here in the white circles is when we added the antibiotics to Schuonella cultures. In the black symbols, what we did was we added sulfite first and then the antibiotics. In that experiment, with all four antibiotics, we saw growth, whereas in the control experiments, all the cells died, okay? So what we think is going on is that sulfite is so reactive, it will react with the antibiotic to modify its chemical structure. And this chemical modification of the antibiotic results in loss of activity, okay? So we just recently published uh, these data in a, in a paper in environmental microbiology reports. So what's, what are we doing now? So we think that the sulfite is not just passively leaking out the cell. We think it's secreted. And we're hypothesizing there's a specific transporter involved in sulfite secretion, okay? One target gene that we're now studying is this tau E enzyme. Okay, so this tau E protein is uh, a membrane bound transporter of some sort that's located suspiciously next to the methionine biosynthesis pathway and the thiosulfate reductase. So we are now doing experiments where screening mutants to see if we can identify a gene or a genetic marker for sulfite uh, secretion. This is important because once we have a genetic marker, then we can probe metagenome sequences to see if this is a, a process is actually occurring in geochemical environments. And how, how common is this? sulfite secretion process, okay? So that's what we're working on now. Okay, so in the final part of my talk, this is the last part of my talk, I'm gonna to try to tie those two uh, ideas together. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the geochemical impact of assimilatory sulfate reduction on chemical weathering. Okay? And I'm gonna use my work on selenium as uh, a case study or how these two processes might be related, okay? So first I'm gonna talk about the old model of how people think uh, selenium is transferred from continents to the oceans. Then I'll talk about some new ideas of how uh, I think this process actually works, okay? So the old idea is that oxygen reacts with reduced selenium containing minerals, either directly or through my microbial catalysis to form selenium oxyanions in the form of selenite and selenate. These oxyana, selenium oxyanions are soluble in water and can be transported by rivers and streams to the ocean. And once it's in the ocean, the selenium is either incorporated by microorganisms or it's uh, reduced and precipitated in sediments. So I'm going to focus on this uh, initial step of selenium weathering. And I'm gonna review why people think oxygen is involved. It has something to do with this, this paper that was published a long time ago by two uh, very famous professors at my university, at Rutgers University, uh, by Jacob Littman and Selman Waxman. This is a paper published in 1923 in Science. So our microbiology building is named after Littman. And Selman Waxman is the only uh, professor at our university to have ever won the Nobel Prize. He uh, discovered that soil microbes uh, produced uh, streptinomycin. He coined the term antibiotics and he uh, streptinomycin cured tuberculosis and he won the Nobel in medicine. Okay, so in 1923, they published this paper in science entitled the oxidation of selenium by a new group of autotrophic microorganisms, where they claimed that there were aerobic chemolith chemolithotrophs that grew by oxidizing reduced selenium 
to selenite and selenate. Okay. Now, uh, in this paper, there's no graphs, no data, okay? Which is, I don't think you can publish a science paper these days without, a, uh, without data, but uh, they certainly did. I, I'm, I'm stuck again, so I need to restart, sorry. Apologize for this. But I was trying to move some stuff on the screen, it's stuck. Okay, so there were no data, no graphs, uh, in this paper, but they do have one sentence at the end of the manuscript. It's a very short article. And they say, a detailed description of the organism as well as of the methods used in its isolation will be published later. Now I've waited for almost a hundred years and this paper has not been published. I've asked all the faculty in the microbiology building if they know anything about these cultures. Uh, nobody knows where this isolate is located. And uh, unfortunately, in the past 100 years, many people, including myself, have tried to reproduce this experiment and have failed. So the next major paper on this topic was also published in Science by two researchers from New Zealand. And this paper is entitled Oxidation of Elemental Selenium to Selenite by Bacillus megaturium. So a strain of Bacillus megaturium Megaturium isolated from soil has been found to oxidize elemental selenium in laboratory cultures to the selenite and traces of selenate. This observation represents an important but here the hitherto unreported oxidative step in the biological selenium cycle. Okay, so I've worked with Bacillus megaturium before. I thought this was a much more tractable approach. So we set out to isolate our own strain of Bacillus to, to further investigate this process. And we obtained samples from uh, uh, Northern India in the Punjab region. So here in this area of, of India, there's extremely saliniferous soils that actually resulted in the poisoning of farm animals, okay? So working with our collaborators at UC Berkeley, Catherine Schilling and uh, Salim Palud, we collected samples from uh, this Punjab area and we set out to isolate um, microbes that could weather selenium from soils, okay? And we were able to isolate this organism, which we designated as JG17. It's a gram-positive spore former, it's a heterotroph. And when we grew it on selenium-containing agar, so we precipitated red elemental selenium in agar plates, and we streaked this microorganism on the agar plates. And we found that this microbe formed this clearing zone where it dissolved the elemental selenium around the colony, okay? So this led us to think that it uh, may have released some sort of reactive compound in dissolving the elemental selenium. This microbe JG17 is closely related to Bacillus megatorium and Bacillus arabati. Um, so, we decided to, to do further exp experimentation with this microbe to see how it dissolves selenium. One of the first experiments we did was we uh, analyzed whether or not the filtrates, so these the spent medium, could dissolve uh, selenium, and in fact it does. So cell-free filtrates, we would grow up the culture, remove the cells, and reacted the filtrates with selenium, and we found that the filtrates will dissolve selenium over time, okay? In sterile controls, the medium does not dissolve selenium, but the filtrates will, okay? We also found that the selenium dissolution activity of the filtrates was dependent on the growth uh, phase of the culture, okay? So uh, early log phase and mid log phase cultures had much less activity compared to late stationary phase and early stationary phase cultures, okay? So the microbes were producing something during growth that accumulated and uh, in the spent medium, and these reactive compounds uh, could dissolve selenium, okay? And indeed, uh, we did find reactive sulfur species in the spent medium, okay? So shown here is the growth curve of JG17. Each data point, is represented by a symbol. These experiments were done in triplicate, 
there's some scatter in the data. That's why I'm showing each replicate uh, independently. The solid line represents the average of the triplicate measurements, okay? So during growth, we measured the production of sulfite. We also saw sulfide and thal sulfate. Now the sulfide data is quite messy, but the thal sulfate data is very coherent, okay? So what's the significance of finding sulfite, sulfide, and thal sulfate in the spent medium? Well, it's because that these compounds can dissolve selenium, okay? So when we conducted abiotic experiments to look at the chemical dissolution of selenium by sulfite, sulfide, and thiol sulfate, we found that all three of these reactive sulfur species dissolve selenium, okay? Sulfide was the most reactive, followed by sulfite, then thiol sulfate. So uh, using the concentrations of sulfite, sulfide, and thiol sulfate we measured in the uh, culture medium, we calculated the amount of selenium dissolution that could occur. And this calculation showed us that these three reactive sulfur species can fully account for the selenium dissolution that we found in the filtrate experiments. And it's in fact well known that these reactive sulfur species can solubilize selenium through the formation of selenyl sulfur complexes. So sulfide can react with selenium to form selenium sulfide. Sulfite can react with selenium to form selenyl sulfate. Thiol sulfate can react with selenium to form selenyl, selenyl thiol sulfate. And these are all soluble uh, aqueous complexes that we think are involved in the weathering of selenium minerals and the transport of selenium from weathering environments in the geosphere to the biosphere. Okay. So we're now developing methods to see if we can directly measure these selenium sulfur complexes in aqueous solutions. Okay, that's just a quick summary of what I talked about today. So I think we found uh, an, an interesting uh, anoxic photochemical re reaction of, of pyrite where we can generate sulfate without oxygen. And this reaction has implications for the sulfur cycle on the early earth. It's interesting that this release of sulfate resulted in the evolution of sophisticated metabolic uh, pathways that allowed microbes to metabolize sulfate and produce these reactive sulfur species. So I'm arguing that micro-mineral interactions evol involving these reactive sulfur species from assimilatory sulfate reduction is a positive feedback mechanism that further drives chemical weathering. Um, so as an example of coevolution of the geosphere and the biosphere. Okay. And with that, I, I thank my uh, funding support. My current research is funded by NASA through an exobiology and a, a grant, as well as the NASA Astrobiology Institute. My selenium research was previously supported by the National Science Foundation in the United States. This work was done by uh, many uh, students and postdocs, as well as um, my collaborators at Rutgers and UC Berkeley. And with that, um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Nathan. This was fascinating. I was just like glued to my chair to like listen to like exactly each of your hypothesis and like make sense. It's like that does make sense. But <laughs> so I have plenty of questions, but I'm going to open uh, the floor to the participants. If uh, any of you have a question, either you can raise your hand so I can see it, type it in the chat, or just unmute yourself or just wave at me so I can see you. Uh, that I should unmute you. Okay, so I'm going to start with Karim. He has his hand raised. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Nathan. Uh, the, 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 these were uh, nice, uh, three nice uh, stories and three nice. Uh, um, uh, topics. Um, uh, back to the, to the first one. So on the the, the, uh, the weathering of, uh, of the pyrites, uh, I was wondering uh, two three things. Uh, first of all, so um, uh, what about um, uh, an oxygeny phototrophs for the production of iron three? So the, this is one sub question. I, I guess this is a 
this is an open question and uh, probably difficult to answer, but okay. Uh, the second on the, so on the, the, the kinetics that the reaction that you showed uh, generating by light, by UV, the, the, the iron three, I was wondering what's the effect of pH. So uh, I, I could see that you start at pH five and, and so what, what, what happens if, if it is buffered and, and at a relatively high uh, values. And second, uh, I mean, if you had also a lot of, uh, of uh, um, also, silicic acid, a lot of uh, silica in, in the solution might. You, I mean, I guess you may you may start forming uh, iron iron silicates, and what uh, how does might. Yeah, it three great questions. Uh, I've been thinking about all three, so I'm excited that you asked this question. These questions. So, let's quickly review why do we think um, photochemistry was was so important on the uh, for driving the iron cycle on the early Earth. So. It's because of these uh, very impressive uh, types of rocks we call banded iron formations. Okay? So banded iron formations are now an extinct rock type. They only formed uh, earlier in Earth's history and they no longer form, form on Earth now. Okay? There are three mechanisms thought to be responsible uh, for banded iron formation um, deposits. One is um, through the evolution of cyanobacteria, the production of oxygen and direct uh, oxidation of ferrous iron by the oxygen produced by cyanobacteria. The second is this anoxygenic phototrophy uh, hypothesis where photoferrotrophs in the absence of oxygen can biologically catalyze ferrous to ferric iron. And the third is this abiotic chemical photooxidation that I've been showing in today's talk. Okay? What I would argue is one, you cannot form banded iron formations without light. On dark planets and dark moons, you, you don't form banded iron formations. That's my, my first uh, bold claim. Second is that uh, there probably is a sequence of evolutionary events. And I would argue this abiotic photochemical reaction is the most ancient one. That anytime you have a star shining on ferruginous waters on any planet in our galaxy, you would have this very primitive, very ancient reaction going. And then you need more evolution before you reach the second stage, which is what I think you're referring to as the anoxygenic phototrophy reaction. The second uh, question was about pH. And pH is a, is a master variable, okay? And if you had buffered systems at neutral pH, this reaction probably would be very slow and uh, inhibited by the precipitation of ferric oxyhydroxides, okay? The reaction I'm showing is most relevant to acid weathering, okay? This would be a more favorable reaction in acidic soils, which is exactly what we see on Mars. I think this reaction also occurs on Mars and we see a lot of sulfates on Mars, okay? That are formed in acidic weathering environments. Okay, so I think this is a, a more applicable at low pH compared to neutral pH, okay? Then the third question uh, was about silica. So we've done experiments now, uh, two types of experiments. One is we have shown uh, that ferrous iron in smectite undergoes photooxidation. And we can also photooxidize uh, grenolite this ferrous silicate precipitate in, in parts. It undergoes photochemical reaction. Actually, why was, one of my graduate students is actually working on that right now, okay? So solid phase ferrous ion undergoes photoreaction. We published a PNS paper to show ferrous carbonase, siderite also undergoes photooxidation. So solid phase uh, is not uh, a barrier to photooxidation you can get, generate ferric ion. The question is how much dissolved ferric ion do you have in reacting with pyrite surfaces? And that is determined by pH. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna have Julie, uh, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Nathan, it was a very interesting talk, thank you. Um, I missed the first 10 minutes or so, so I hope you didn't answer my question already, but, um, I, I was wondering if in, in your first experiment, uh, um, do, do you see any elemental sulfur forming? Because when you, 
when you react sulfide with a, uh, iron three, typically you would form elemental sulfur. So um, I'm just curious. We have not done the full uh, sulfur speciation. What we have found is that there's very little sulfite, but I would, uh, I would guess there would be elemental sulfur formed in those experiments. So we have not uh, done the full sulfur mass balance yet, which is I something see. we definitely need to do. And that's a great suggestion. Um, what we do know is that um, the iron chemistry is very messy because as you photo oxidize the, the pyrite, you're releasing more ferrous iron and there's sources and sinks and it's going, uh, so it's very hard to close that mass balance. But I think with the sulfur story, I think that's a very important uh, aspect of this experiment that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Francois, you have a question? Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Nathan, for the great talk. It's very interesting. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I was just wondering what was your uh, view of the Archean sulfur cycle? When you add, uh, of, of course, photochemically, you produce the sulfur zero plus the, plus the sulfate, and then uh, you end up in the pyrite. So uh, what, what is the main reducing agents which are implied in this? Uh, because there is a reduction to pyrite, right? So, so you, you need an electron donor somewhere. So what, what, what is this, in the, or what are they? Right, so I think on the early Earth, um, you, ha you had very few oxidants. You were oxidants sure, limited. Sure. And you, I think you had a lot of reductance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I don't know what the latest estimates are for uh, the amount of organic carbon that mm -hmm. is uh, primitive, the primitive organic carbon. That means before life, the amount of organic you know, tar that was on earth uh, as it formed. Okay. But for certain, hydrogen was a major uh, reductant of the early Earth, both through suprintonization. And another thing I didn't mention is that uh, this iron photooxidation experiment. So I asked one of my graduate students, the iron is being photooxidized. Where's the electron going? Mm -hmm. Where's yep. the electron going? And it turns out when we measure the headspace of these reactors, there's lots of hydrogen gas being formed in the headspace, okay? So hydrogen could have also been produced by photochemistry. So there's water rock interactions that can produce hydrogen and a lot of uh, photo hydrogen is also produced by um, photochemistry. So I think hydrogen was a, one of the first uh, electron donors to fuel um, microbial metabolism. So when the elemental sulfur and sulfate deposit into the oceans, if there was biogeochemical cycling of that sulfur, I think it was driven by hydrogen uh, H2 gas. Okay, because uh, yeah, this is interesting because the, of course, uh, the obvious uh, way to form pyrite in a anoxic environment would be to use the FES, right? The sulfides and to react them with uh, sulfur. But then uh, it, it turns out that you don't even need the, the anything you just need water right on the FES and you can make a part of the pyrites just by the dismutation of FES with with water with H2S gives you so like H2O plus water equals yes. close to pyrite with FES2 plus H2 and I was I was wondering uh, how much of the pyrite could be I think it should be isotopically very uh, recognizable right In, uh, with some uh, and, and I'm wondering whether people have looked at the proportion of the pyrite that could be formed not from these uh, oxidized forms of sulfur, but oh, from, the, from just see. the FES by itself. Right. Which is a That's an interesting theory. question. That's an interesting question. What I'm more interested in is the uh, Archean barites that have this potential yeah. sulfate yeah. Yeah. <laughs> signature, because mm. I have this hypothesis that. Uh, if you have oxygen oxidizing pyrite, you should have this O17 anomaly because mm -hmm. as oxygen circulates the stratosphere, there's mass yeah. interaction of oxygen isotopes. But my reaction that there should be no O17 anomaly in that uh, sulfate. Um, so mm. I don't know. So I'm trying to get people to measure that. For, I can't measure the O7, the triple oh. oxygen isotope, but I, I'm very interested if somebody can. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Um, uh, I think Karim has a follow up, maybe. Or another yes, uh, so, sorry, I, I had uh, this question, uh, um, um, naive question. I, I think I have read uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the paper by, by Kurt uh, several years ago uh, about, uh, about this uh, sulfur cycle, but uh, I can't remember it well. Uh, I was wondering, so if you want to start to feed uh, the, the sulfur to the, the oceans, I guess one, then through weathering of pirates, I guess one of the major parameters is uh, uh, the controlling parameter is uh, how much fresh pyrite you bring to the surface of the continents, right? And uh, so that you can uh, weather it. And so then that means erosion. And, and I was wondering, is there any, I mean, do we have any evidence about um, right? Reason? So that's one of the bottlenecks why we don't want to publish yet. Um, we're still playing around with this model. Okay. So the, the question is, one question is how much continental landmass was above water uh, at that time? Then what a proportion of that landmass was sedimentary rocks, which is the uplift. Okay. So, you know, we can play games. Is it 1%, you know? I mean, there's orders of magnitudes here, okay? So uh, we're trying to just test this, our box models to see uh, how much uh, sedimentary rocks there were on, on land, how much of this was black shale, how much pyrite was in these black shales, and where do we have to kind of land before we can deliver enough sulfate to the oceans to uh, explain the increases of marine sedimentary sulfate over time, right? So. I'm not, uh, so I have a postdoc working on this, uh, Ji Waha, who's much more creative than me. <laughs> I'm not that comfortable with these models, but I do think it's a good first order uh, approximation to just see where we are in, in that question. So Green, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Thanks. Um, Francia, do you have a question or it's just, uh, it's from the last time? No, no, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, okay, to... no, that's okay. Um, I'm just double checking if anyone else has a question. Vous pouvez demander votre question en français si vous voulez. Well, Nathan, <laughs> you do speak my way better French than me, I will admit. I've been here for two years and I, I can only say the greetings. So. I went to a French school my whole life as a child. So oh, I uh, took all my okay. classes in French. <laughs> okay, uh, so. okay. <laughs> You had a head start, I'll take I think. had a head start. <laughs> yeah. um, I just had a, uh, since I don't see any other hands, I'm just gonna ask more basic questions, but and move from the, from away from your first story to the last story about selenium. And I was just curious, and it, it might be a very naive, like when you start talking about yourself, your filters or the spent media, and you show that how, if you, you put the spent media in with selenium and you start seeing this, generation of these uh, soluble selenium species. Out of curiosity, is this spent free media, is it a specifically characteristic of the JG17 or is it gonna be of any ARS uh, exhibiting um, uh, bacteria which has the mechanism or the metabolism? Sure. So I, I, uh, I this, this I, I skipped over a lot of data. Okay. So we actually spent years thinking it was a completely different mechanism. Okay, okay, because at this time, when we were doing these experiments, um, Colleen Hansel mm -hmm. was publishing all these papers on manganese oxidation yeah. by reactive oxygen species. So we yeah. thought JG17 was producing some sort of reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. So we did all these quenching. So we analyzed the filtrates for a superoxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide. We did all these experiments, uh, you know, but, you know, and we, we ruled out a lot of different things. It wasn't okay. a nitrogen compound. It wasn't an oxygen species. So, uh, uh, so I guess the question is, so when we discovered these reactive sulfur species, the question yeah. is how common is the production of reactive sulfur species yeah. by bacteria? I think it's ubiquitous. I think okay. it's ubiqu ubiquitous. Yeah. And I think these a particular sulfite is so reactive. It's ephemeral in sediments and soils because they react immediately with the surrounding geochemical uh, mineralogic matrix. Okay. okay so you, you don't find it in sediments or soils because it's reacting with minerals. So microbes, and that is important. That's important. That's one way microbes are in, interacting with the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So uh, that's why it's very, so to answer your question, we're, we're pursuing a genetic approach. We want to find a genetic marker that's specific to sulfite secretion, then look at uh, microbial genomes and metagenomes to see mm -hmm. how common uh, this process is. Okay, instead of screening every bacterial culture, yeah. to see yeah. if that media always contains these metabolites, we're going to take a genetic approach. Okay. And that's the long game that we want to play. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think we are running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to save my questions for maybe over email or something. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you, Nathan, for such an excellent talk. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, staying with us. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to see you all for our next seminar back in June, I suppose. So thank you again. And I hope to one day uh, see you all at a conference uh, when we resume travel. Uh, if not, uh, I'll come and visit you in Europe the next time I'm in Paris. Merci. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, 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 my son's learning French. So I said, when you <laughs> learn French, we can go to uh, France uh, for a vacation. Ah. <laughs> so that's, so that he's, he's working on it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone and uh, have a good rest of the day uh, and uh, see you around. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Merci, bonne journée. Merci, salut. Merci. À la